Is it possible that Oppenheimer is the first blockbuster film in recent memory where Hollywood nailed the history? Let's find out. Sit back and enjoy the newest edition of AD History Watches with your hosts, Paul K. DiCostanzo and Patrick Foote. And brought to you live via London and San Luis, Missouri, you are watching the AD History Podcast. I am Paul K. DiCostanzo, and I am joined by my co-host, Patrick Foote. Patrick, you know, this is an interesting occasion, and it's a very appropriate one. Mm. For the first time, you and I have ever gone and done a show live. Yeah, it's really exciting to be doing this live. We've been talking about it for ages trying to figure out something live to do and the planet's just aligned and here we are i felt like this was a great thing great topic to talk about for our first live episode because the whole point of live it's now it's present and we're talking about something extremely present for once here on ad history we talk about a recent film that's actually come out only a few weeks back yeah indeed in fact we probably would have even done this a little bit sooner but obviously scheduling was what it yeah. was yeah yeah scheduling was in our favor well, the thing that's interesting about this little start and our foray into doing mm. some live episodes here on YouTube is, in particular, one, this is roughly our fourth birthday of AD yeah. history. So, Gosh, happy four. anniversary to you and I, right? Old enough to walk? I don't know what children could do. Can they walk by four? Can they talk by four? I can't remember. But happy uh, fourth yeah. anniversary to AD history. I think there are, those are usually pretty pretty big red flags <laughs> if, if, they, if they cannot. But, but that's another story for another time, of course. That, and just given the topic of the film we're going to mm. be discussing today, we fall pretty much square between the 78th anniversaries of the atomic bombing of Hiroshima and then the atomic bombing of Nagasaki. Hiroshima happening on the 6th of August, 1945, and Nagasaki happening on the 9th of we August, 1945. We definitely planned that. That wasn't a coincidence. We oh, definitely yeah, planned totally. That you know, we, are, we have it all together that mm, much, to be yeah, sure. We know what we're doing. We know what we're doing. And so if you are a longtime listener or viewer of AD history mm. or an intermediate term one, you've been following us for a little while, obviously you've noticed that there was a bit of a hiatus there between February and April, and or actually really May. <laughs> Who am I yeah. yeah, it's a bit of a time off, but that was it was for factors quite far out of our control, as I'm sure you're going to explain. Yeah, just and, and very briefly, because none of the episodes that we've released in that time, a couple of them mm. since, have were done and, and ultimately filmed, recorded when all of this went down. But basically, mm. in the beginning of this year in January, my wife and I basically uh, received an opportunity that we had been wanting for a long time, a very long time, as you know personally. Mm. Oh, gosh, yeah. And we ended up moving from New York City <laughs> to the Big um, Apple to the Gateway of the West in America's heartland, St. Louis, Missouri. It which sounds is now yeah. where I call home. Yeah. Of course, the, the issue is obviously anytime you basically have four or five weeks to, to move even down the street, that's like no time yeah. at all. No. Moving so you're in another time zone is a completely different thing. Oh, gosh, yeah. And in our case, you know, we didn't have a, our own accommodation set up on the fly that quickly. I mean, we no, could have, no. but we wouldn't have gotten a place that we would have been altogether that happy with at that point in time. I mean, it was only a couple of years back that I moved four hours across the country, which is kind of big in UK standards. But yeah, you yeah. moved to, like you said, a completely different time zone. You're you're about a four hour flight away from where you used to live. So it was a quite not, a not dramatic... four hours. But it was about two, two and a half. Oh, but that's that's still that's quite still a enough. while to say the least. Yeah, that's especially for enough. if you live on a tiny little island like I do, that sounds hum like a gargantuan task. So it makes all the sense in the world that we had a bit of a slip up there. But what's been good is we've actually got quite a bit of content in the can to say the least that like we've we've been carrying recording it's just been getting edited and out but there's loads in the pipeline ready for you guys to enjoy 
all very fun stuff mm. in our fifth season, to be sure. Yeah. But ultimately, about a couple of months ago, we finally secured the place where this mm. new studio of mine is yeah. now located. Yeah, whole studio to yourself. Amazing times. I, I couldn't be happier with how things have worked out in that regard. So mm. if you are a listener or watcher of AD History and you're from the Midwest, you have AD <laughs> History as one of your new neighbors. Exactly. So, just a little insight in terms of what's going on here. Yeah. However, mm. that is business aside. We yes. have something far, far bigger to tackle today. Huge something that subject. I think you and I are really very much looking forward to tackling. Yeah. And that is an AD history watches. I always love Oppenheimer. Yeah, I always love doing these AD history watches. And especially on this one, I think more or less since the moment we knew about this film or close to release, we're like, we we gotta talk about this straight off the bat because this is something not only are we both personally invested in in regards to the history of it. It's a, it's a subject we've both tackled before, whether that be with the atomic bombing video we did a few a, a while back. Yes. Or I've just recently done an Oppenheimer video over on Name Explained. This is knowledge. Which I watch, by the oh, way. Okay. Very nice work. Thank you. I hope you enjoy that. Um, I did. So it's just amazing to have this film. It's just all worked out perfectly for us. I'm really excited to actually talk about this. I guess the first thing, Paul, is what are your overall thoughts on this film? Well... The first thing I got to say is, I, I like I like the lumber glasses. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, I just got them the other day. I, I, I take it you've seen Office Space. I haven't, but I've, I've, I've had many comments so far varying from different things. So I think from some American Psycho comments to some uh, Chief Brody from Jaws comments, all, all kinds of things. Oh, but yeah, I guess that would make sense now, wouldn't it? I've been no, told they're back thing. in trend. <laughs> uh, well, hey, you know, trends and fashions mm. are circular. Who, who are we kidding? Well, in any case, yeah, this is an incredible movie, uh, especially mm. from an 80 History Watches perspective, because we've gone and done 80 History Watches episodes in the past. Mm. And, you know, almost all of them were obviously lacking significantly in the historical accuracy standpoint. And probably the worst, because it's the one that takes itself the most serious in terms of how it portrays it, was the imitation game, mm. which is one of the big reasons that I have so many issues with it. However, this is a very different beast, a very different beast, mm. Patrick, because Christopher Nolan went an extraordinarily long way to make sure that this film in particular was not lacking in that department. And so no. my overall thoughts on the film are, wow, this is this is great. We finally have a film that we're, for the most part, other than some you know details here and there, and they're minor at best. Mm. We don't have to go and sit here for the next hour and a half and correct its homework. <laughs> no, yeah, this is. I was amazed, I said, from what we know about the story of Oppenheimer already. He lived a really fascinating life. This is broadly accurate in so many ways there were quite minimal changes made that we don't need to point out and go, oh that's not historically accurate they nolan did a terrific job with portraying the real life history on screen of this film and i was very surprised by that and i found out something really interesting about the screenplay of this film is that they were doing like one of those you know, major cast member on the couch type mm. variety interviews or E or whatever, you know, the yeah, know standard Hollywood junket type stuff with all the major roles and the actors who are in that film. And something I found out that was very interesting is that the screenplay apparently was mostly written in the first person perspective of Oppenheimer. Yeah, I read that. What a fascinating idea to write. I can't even comprehend what that would look like. Like, how would you write a screenplay in the first person perspective? Apparently, it was a little jarring. Mm. Just because, you know, most of these folks obviously are all extremely accomplished in the extreme in terms of their craft. Mm. And so they were all taken by it as you imagine they would be. And 
it basically, from what I understand, is you know I walked over to the window and thought X Y Z wow. and, and, and said da 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 da. You get the idea. So that you know that in and of itself is something to to behold to say yeah. the least, and it very much encapsulates, I think. What Nolan was really trying to do, which was yeah. to tell the story of Oppenheimer as he experienced these tremendous events. Yes, and that's something you see through the way this film is produced. So it's not outright said, but it's been theorized online. And you can see it for yourself. The black and white scenes are the scenes not from Oppenheimer's perspective. Yeah. Yeah, and we Absolutely. see that. Like, I mean, first I'm going to say sort of spoilers for Oppenheimer, slash, but this is sort of spoilers for history anyway, I guess. Hard um, movies to spoil. Time. Yeah, there, there's a scene by a pond, and we see it in black and white from Strauss's perspective, played by Robert Downey Jr., who we'll talk about in a bit. And then we see it once again in color from Oppenheimer's perspective. That kind of makes you realize how he's playing with that filmmaking technique. And it's just a really clever way to see it. But yeah, by and large, this is a film incredibly focused on the man himself and that's just it's a very bold thing to do for killian murphy he's in pretty much every scene of this film and knocked out of the park at every moment it was um really terrific stuff it is and especially if you're when you're trying to capture that first per first person perspective mm. of j robert oppenheimer not easy to do he was no. something of an enigma himself well, that's interesting. So um, we talked about this off air, but um, I went to go see this with my dad. And one of the comments he made about it was, we learned so much about him, but we actually don't know. You don't actually, you don't also don't know much about him at the same time. It's very enigmatic in that way. Like we see a bunch of his life, but you don't really know much about the man once the film is done. Well, let's talk a little bit about his life because mm. there, there may, you know, you watching or later listening, may not be all that familiar with J. Robert Oppenheimer. A lot of mm. people have heard the name Oppenheimer, but they may not necessarily have, you know, put it as to who exactly mm. he was, whether that be J. Robert Oppenheimer, who was more or less the, the scientific uh, administrative director and the, you know, direct scientific consultant to Leslie Groves, mm. Or hearing when they were a bit younger commercials, especially if you're an American, for the Oppenheimer Fund. So it's a name you heard. And you may know some Oppenheimers yourself. J. Robert Oppenheimer, despite the fact that he liked to claim that the J didn't stand for anything, it was a <laughs> null initial, it was Julius after his yes, father. Yes, yeah, it was Julius. He was born in uh, Robert Oppenheimer. Mm. was born in 1904, I, I believe, in Manhattan, to an extremely well-to-do family. I mean, very, mm. very wealthy. And his father is interesting because he actually emigrated here from Germany. Um, he followed his two uncles. His two uncles, by the time he even got here, were mm. extremely successful in business. You know, they were in, I believe, the clothing industry, textiles, which I also believe is what his father got into. Okay. And, and boy, did they make a lot of money. Yeah. <laughs> you know, these, these folks, you know, the, the, young, the young Bobby Oppenheimer, as it mm. were, as a tot, he wanted for nothing. Yeah. They, their, uh, their apartment, <laughs> use that very loosely, <laughs> was buying out the entire 11th floor on a... Uh, on a very, very nice building on Riverside Drive in the Upper West Side of Manhattan. That's not bad at all. Uh, no. <laughs> no. And it was immediately apparent, Patrick, mm. that this kid was extremely bright from a young age. Yeah, that's what I sort of gathered from my research from my Oppenheimer video, too. He was a very, very bright boy from the get-go. And anything that he showed some you know, generally concentrated, you know, interest in from a young mm. age at that, his parents made sure to very much encourage it. If and he, something, well, sorry, well, I was going to say, we'll get back to your point there mm. in a moment. If he had, you know, showed any interest in art and painting, they made sure he had the mm. best tools, brushes and paints, which also makes sense because his mother was an artist and also accumulated quite a few very valuable pieces yes, of art. Yes, I heard about that. 
that uh, his brother, fr younger brother Frank, later sold in life when, you know, more or less he couldn't hmm. get gainful employment anymore. I think he only had to sell one of those pieces. Maybe it was a Van Gogh or something hmm. like that, where the the return on that sale allowed he and his family to live in absolute comfort for the remainder of their life. Uh, I can imagine. So, I mean, he really, really wanted for nothing. But you were going to say. Yeah, well, you kind of hit the nail on the head there. What I find fascinating about Oppenheimer and his uh, younger life, his educational background, he wasn't science through and through. He wasn't a STEM, he wasn't like a pure STEM student like we've seen with people like Turing no, or Einstein. No, not at all. He, he, he did literature, he did arts, he studied multiple languages. We see that in the film. He does a presentation in German, I believe. It's kind of Dutch. off the cuff saying, Dutch, apologies. Dutch. Yeah. So, sorry, Dutch speakers. No, that's all right. Cool. Right now. And after only having been in, you know, in the yeah, Netherlands exactly. for like a month or something like that. But he was a very like left brain and right brain person, for lack of a better term. That's something else I found interesting in regards to his characterization. Um, we talked about this when we talked about imitation game. There's going to be probably some analogy to that film because they both follow into brilliant minds who did amazing things during the Second World War. So there is going to be some parallels between the two. Um, Turing in that film is very much portrayed as like the unsocial genius. Um, and he wasn't that at all. He was an absolute cad in real life, Alan, Alan Turing. They didn't go, and we talked about it. I don't know if he it. was quite a cad, but he was certainly <laughs> much warmer. Yes, yeah, much warmer and kinder than... Um, and the, not nearly the, as, like, absent. No, kind of on the spectrum, I think we talked about that. That's how, that's how they're trying to portray it yeah. in the film at the time, yeah. And that isn't there at all. It, they easily could have done that with Oppenheimer, but they haven't at all. You know, B11 here just put up yes. an, an incredible quote because I was just thinking this easily three minutes ago and, and you beat me to the punch, mm. which is that you could call J. Robert Oppenheimer a modern renaissance man. Yes, yeah. Great insight there. We love it. Absolutely. Thank you very much for the comment. Our first live stream comment. Amazing. Thank you very much, B11. Absolutely. No, definitely. If you have stuff to say, enter the conversation. We want to hear from you. We want your insight. Yeah. If you have seen the movie, if you haven't seen the movie, if you got questions, by all means, we're talking. We're all enjoying yeah. talking about this movie right now. Yeah, that's what we're here for. Especially if you're history and, you know, you got to be history to the hilt to enjoy AD history. Yeah, sure. to be here in the first place, you've got to know some stuff about history. What did you think about all the pink and the big plastic cars, pool? <sighs> that's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> did I see the wrong film? <laughs> uh, uh, you know what? That's... Uh, <laughs> It, I don't know exactly if they <laughs> how they expected this to play out. No, but ad hoc, they seem to have kind of created this weird symbiotic relationship. Yeah, it's been quite the cultural phenomenon, Bob and Hawk. That was a joke about Barbie what's come out uh, at yeah, the same yeah, time. Yeah, of course. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, it doing was... double features and whatnot. You've yeah, seen them both. I've only seen I, the one. I have seen them both. I thought they were both terrific films for very different reasons. Um but it's just fantastic seeing people play about the jokes and the memes of uh, the Barbenheimer. Just great seeing just two completely different films just smash it around the world with reviews and box office and all that sort of stuff. It's just amazing. No, we had to we had to give an ode to Barbie at some point during this podcast. Just had to had to get out of the way there and then. Yeah, little little eyes right. Yeah, that's in review. But the thing I was going to say though mm. about Oppenheimer from a young age, and this is an incredible mm. story. I don't, this was a story that was actually in American Prometheus book that of course the biography the one that won the pulitzer of mm. which this film was so yes, strongly yeah. based it wasn't the book adapted screenplay but no you get the idea anyway when he was like around like nine ten years old he ended up developing this really um intense and deep fascination and knowledge of geology hmm and he began a written correspondence with one of the, like the big academic, you know, uh, figures that also happened, I believe, live in New York City at the time. And this went on for a couple of years. And you know, he'd go out into Central Park or or wherever, and he'd collect these things and he'd keep this going. The thing was, when he was communicating with this person. He never mentioned to him how old he was at the time. Oh, so he thought like this guy, this geologist, thought he was talking to like a fellow like middle-aged old person or something. Big old enthusiast there. Mm. He ended up 
getting an invitation to address, I believe it was the New York Mineralogical Society. Oh. And he started freaking out and he was like, Dad, you got to tell him I'm, you know, I'm only like 13 years old. <laughs> He's somewhere between 12 and 14. But he actually ended up going and addressing them. And I seem to recall something of a quip from the book where somebody uh, either yelled out or like made, you know, kind of comedically like, hey, you know, you got to get him, uh, you know, a milk crate to stand up on so you can see him <laughs> over the podium. So that was the kind of thing. It, and he was very yeah. seriously minded. You know, he he was interested in the world around him. Obviously, he was very much supported by his parents in this mm. regard. Very studious. But the thing that's interesting, and this is such a big contrast from the Oppenheimer we would know in his later years when he's really entering his prime, mm. is he, despite all of this, he never really knew how to make a friend. No, yeah, he's not sort of, he's got colleagues and he's sort of wife. He's got many lovers, which the film talks about, of course, with Gene Tatlock. But he had many, many other lovers beyond that as well. But he hasn't really got any close friends to say. Not until he gets later into his teenage years and his two closest friends are actually ones he makes out in New Mexico. Oh, of course, yeah. Which is interesting in and of itself. And, and, and in terms of his dynamic with women and the women that he was associated mm. with in his life, uh, you know, his, you know, uh, his ability with women is not something that really blossomed until later on. Yeah. Uh, Why did it blossom? <laughs> yeah. And so he ended up going to Europe briefly as a young man. He actually got quite sick there. This is before Cambridge or any of that. Mm. And he came back and he convalesced in Mexico, not in Mexico, New Mexico. New Mexico, the New Mexico, not the old Mexico. Yeah, no, no, not the old Mexico. <laughs> but in that time, afterwards, he ends up going to Harvard. Mm. And for him at that time, apparently, and this is according to Ray Monk, who, who wrote Oppenheimer, A Life in the Center, which is another biography of his. Mm. Now, granted, if I was his publishing company, I wouldn't have called it Oppenheimer a life at the center. I would have called it Oppenheimer a life in the epicenter. Yes, yeah, great pun. No, I mean, you know, ex exactly. We're talking atomic and nuclear weapons. Yeah. You know, why not lean on that a little bit, right? If, if there were nothing other than marketing purposes, we're trying to sell books here. Mm. And one of the things that he runs into there, because prior to that, his formal education, a lot of which happened at the... Um, the Ethical Center School, which is part mm. of the the Ethical Center, which is, you know, it was kind of like the, uh, kind of leaned on the American Enlightenment mm. in many respects. And he went to the Ethical Culture School when his time come to actually get into mm. proper schooling. And it was the first time truly that he ever was kind of on the outs because he was Jewish. I was curious. I don't think the film doesn't delve into his religious side that much. But when you mentioned his father was a tailor and worked in textiles, I know that. Oh, no, not, not a tailor. I mean, he, he was a manufacturer. Yeah, manufacturer. I know that was a very, like, big part of Judaism, Jewish Jewish New Yorkers. It was a big sort of textiles industry around the aspects. I was wondering, oh, he must, I wonder if he did have Jewish background. But yeah, the film doesn't delve into his religion all that much. Ray Monk, once again, mm. Oppenheimer, A Life in the Center. I was watching a uh, a really excellent uh, address he did for, for the book at the Institute for Advanced Studies, coincidentally, which Oppenheimer mm. was later in life the head of at Princeton. Mm. And for Oppenheimer and his his descendants, mm. they, for the most part, not his family directly, but a lot of, apparently a lot of German Jews were the first Jews from Europe really to come here in, in any sort of large number. Mm. And they were, for the most part, far more established and far more successful by the time you get to the turn of the 20th century and a little bit later after that, and you begin seeing immigration from of Jews from Eastern Europe, Russia, and they had plenty of really good reasons to emigrate. You know, the Russian Empire is not exactly known for no. their track record for uh, 
humanitarian treatment, and, and especially not in regards to their relationship to their Jewish uh, populations. Yeah. I mean, look, just look at the Pale of Settlement. Yeah. But, but he was part of that crowd. But there's also another crowd, which is the Eastern Europeans, which came later. Mm. They're mostly in the Lower East Side of mm. Manhattan. And much more of a recent, uh, you know, emigrate community. Whereas the Germans had been, German Jews had been here longer and mm. more successfully they could go and live and be successful enough so they can afford to live in a place like the Upper West Side of Manhattan mm. on Riverside Drive, which yeah. I have spent many a, a <laughs> lovely Sunday morning on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, and there's nothing quite like it at all. I can tell you that much. Even before New York started its huge gentrification, that part of Manhattan has always been very wealthy and very elite. Well, you're talking about a good century later. I'm yeah. sure you, yeah. New York went went through plenty of its own seediness. Yes, oh in yeah. In the time before that. Believe We've me, all Times seen Square. Ghostbusters. We know what Ghostbusters used to, we know what New York used to be like. <laughs> but in any case, um when it comes to Oppenheimer and the group that he's part of, and, and I and I do see uh B eleven here mentioning Yeah, some great comments. Yeah, absolutely. Not not to forget that New York was a, a Dutch colony. First. Yeah, of course. Uh, of of course. But relative to the community of which Robert Oppenheimer was a part, which is the mm. German Jewish community. You're talking about emigration largely in the middle of the 19th century, mm. and but all fair points entirely. And, and yes, thank, thank you, you very, very much, much for yeah. your contribution on that part, to be sure. However, it's the first time he kind of finds himself on the outs. Mm. And one of the interesting things about Oppenheimer is, above all else, and this was again according to Ray Monk. He always saw himself very much as an American. Yes, yeah, like his. Cause it's interesting because this is at a time uh, of great anti-German sentiment. So the fact when he's you even start getting late into like the First World War experience. Yeah, yeah. Even like during, during World War Two and whatnot. This is so. It's amazing that his name alone never raises suspicions. And there's other things he's accused of, and that's a huge part of the story for sure. And we'll talk about that in a moment. Yeah, but, I mean, the anti-German sentiment wasn't yeah. totally out of control in the First World War, but it, it was there. Yeah, it was there. But mm. in this case, no. He found himself at Harvard not being able to join some of the the best clubs and societies, and not being able, to, you know necessarily be able to stay in in the best housing mm. and that's the thing with the, the um the film doesn't really tackle much of his actual childhood i think the youngest we not see at him all, is, really. no no i think the youngest we see him still played by killian murphy is uh, as a student at cambridge with the poison apple story which is true that is an actual true story he did almost poison one of his uh teachers patrick betterman i can't remember his name patrick i remember his first name obviously but um something like that yeah that is a true tale he did almost poison his uh, teacher with an apple and actually i also think he tried to, to strangle a, a, a fellow an, a, an instructor prior to yeah. that but yeah he didn't enjoy his time at cambridge that was a big like he really didn't get on there but um in any case he, no he didn't and after the incident with the apple basically his parents came over to mm you know, intervene, find out what the heck is going on. And the folks at Cambridge basically said he can only stay here if he gets psychiatric help. <laughs> but it's also around the same time that he's really first introduced to theoretical phys physics as opposed yes. to experimental physics, which for him was night and day. One, he was not good in the lab. No. And they show them... They show that perfectly, yeah, fumbling around. Many, and, and the way they show those earlier parts of his life in the film is done very masterfully, to say the least. Mm. But it isn't until he's in Germany where, at the time, and this is prior to 1932, when a, reg uh, a very notorious regime came to power where being Jewish and a theoretical physicist really puts you on a, a very specific target list. Mm. And he got to work with some, you know, Max Born. He got to make the acquaintance of Niels Bohr. Mm. I think you may have known uh, Heisenberg. Yeah, Heisenberg's in the film. Yeah, not 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 the not the fi fictional 
meth king, but uh, I mean, it is set in New York. It is set in New Mexico. Heisenberg in New Mexico. (laughs) There's a bit more of a connection there. (laughs) Part of it, to be sure. And then when he starts to complete his PhD there, of course, Mm. he very much undertakes the idea that obviously Europe, Central Europe especially, but Europe in general, is just blowing away the United States, North America, in Mm. the theoretical physics department there. Mm. We got to bring this back to the United States. Yeah. Which ultimately allows him to get out to the West Coast, where he spends initially half the year up at UC Berkeley, and then half the year at Caltech in Southern California. Uh, The first, so he could really begin building a program of his own design, And the other, so that he can continue to mingle and debate and be part of very important, weighty discussions in theoretical physics down at Caltech. Mm. And this is the time where we get into one of the major aspects of the film. Yes. Because it is his time with his students out in California, where it's the first time he's ever really introduced to politics in any meaningful way prior to that point he had been a total neophyte and this is something i find interesting because when i sort of after i was done watching i was kind of thinking to myself what is this film actually about like if you were to give a synopsis of the, the plot of this film you could just say oh it's a biopic of oppenheimer but that's a bit vague it The atomic bomb stuff for huge parts of this film takes a backseat. The main driving narrative of this film is the communist allegations, I really feel like. But that's that's where that's where most of the story goes and the huge chunks. You don't the atomic bomb his work is kind of just a backdrop to that story between is he a communist or not? And I found that really interesting. It's interesting because you have to ask Mm. yourself, well, what's the film about? And primarily primarily it's it's about him but you know digging a little deeper than that it's the the communist thing Mm. and it's the atomic bomb and we're going to touch on both of those things because they're just too big and this is 80 history we got to get into the history of these things yeah and i think what's interesting is this film publicized heavily the atomic bomb factor of this and If you didn't, like, I've, I've listened to some reviews of this film on podcasts. Like, I didn't know anything. And they were saying, I didn't know anything about the communist allegations part of it. So I think that took a lot of people off guard because a lot of this film, at points, like, if you have to put this film into a genre, it's a courtroom drama for so much of it. To the degree. I think that's the thing a lot of people were expecting. There's no war scenes. You don't, you don't see the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. You see the Trinity test, of course. You don't see, it doesn't ever cut to like war raging in Europe or anything like that. You don't see Pearl Harbor. This is a war film in the vaguest sense. And this is actually, uh, you and I were discussing this. I think Mm. I mentioned it to you in uh, in an email prior to you and I doing all this. Hello, Casual Crisp. Hi. Sorry. Casual Crisp. Thank you for joining us. Anyway. I think you'd call them Casual Chip. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> no, no, I would call them Casual Crisp. <laughs> I'm, making, I'm making a UK British joke. I would call them Casual Crisp. You'd call them Casual Chip. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> yeah. But Sorry, you were in, saying. He's introduced to um, far left politics from mm. his students because mm. now you're getting into a time of the late 20s and early 30s. And he's so well off and so off in his own world, he doesn't apparently even know that about the stock market crash. He has to be told later on. Yeah. And he's he's taking notice because so many of his students are not being gainfully employed or all these sort of things. And like many, both in the United States or in Europe in particular, a lot of people are being drawn to the far left. And the mm. 30s are, you know, one of the critical times here. Yeah. Right? Because there's a couple of things that happen very critically. The first, of course, is Adolf Hitler 
becoming Chancellor of Germany mm-hmm. and then ultimately becoming Fuhrer. That's something that can't be ignored. <laughs> that, that, that's a little thing that happened. And the other is the Spanish Civil War. Mm, which is mentioned in this, isn't it? Spanish, yeah, the Spanish Civil War is mentioned in this. Hitler's barely mentioned at all, but I can't remember in what context. Some of his students have gone off to fight in the Spanish Civil War? Yes, there, there yeah. are foreign legions that go and fight on behalf of the Spanish Republicans. Mm. Against the Spanish nationalists, of course, which were led by Francisco Franco. Mm. And we're not going to go big here into the Spanish Civil War because that's not the point of this. No, no, no. It's no. just one element of his life. And just giving a very bare bones explanation of this. All right. So don't, if, there's only so much we can cover here realistically yeah, in 90 yeah. minutes. Basically, the Spanish Civil War was something that was initially something that had been broiling for decades prior to this point mm. the the tensions that lead to it and was inherently really at the beginning the product of domestic internal spanish affairs mm. but it does not remain that way for very long starting 1936 mm. because both the 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 main factor the main folks who are fighting here which of course are the republican government mm. and the nationalist government in the case of the republican government they're very much being backed by the soviet union who even though they're technically neutral mm. are, are very are very much involved in the popular front on the left mm. and on the right the spanish nationalists led by francisco franco are being very much supported by Nazi Germany and fascist That would make Italy. sense. Yeah, that would make sense. I mean, sense. one of the, the big early moments of the war is the case of Franco is getting the portion of the army that is loyal to him in Morocco and the Canary Islands onto the Iberian Peninsula. And the Navy did not turn the way that they had hoped, you know, a.k.a. the guys that are going to give us a ride. Mm. So they needed to be airlifted for the most part. And after some hemming and hawing and some convincing, Hitler allows us to go forward in terms mm. of Luftwaffe support to get them over. But it doesn't end there. You start, they start supplying them with all sorts of things because even there wouldn't have been – this is interesting because this is an Antony Beaver's the Spanish Civil War. Fantastic, mm. fantastic account mm-hmm. of this conflict. Apparently, there wasn't even enough munitions – in the country in the first week of the war, in, in Beaver's words, mm. to, to, to last fighting for a few days. <laughs> so both, you know, you had Nazi Germany and fascist Italy backing Francisco Franco and the nationalists. And of course you have the Soviet Union backing the Republican government. Mm. And... This attracts folks from on the left very significantly yes. who will go over and fight. Yeah. In fact, his his wife, Kitty, her second husband yes. is killed fighting in the Spanish Civil War. That's where it's mentioned in the film. I remember saying like he died for nothing. Like he died as he, he yeah, yeah, I remember that mentioning there. Yeah, it it was it was not it wasn't good. And in the case of Oppenheimer, he gave quite um a bit of con you know, quite a bit of monetary contribution supporting mm the republican side of the uh, of the conflict but his interest only lasts so long and that particular war lasts for three years Mm. with a definitive victory on the part of francisco franco and the nationalists who will end up being very much indebted to nazi germany and fascist italy Mm. for being to achieve just that though they Mm. remain officially neutral and non-belligerent during the Second World War. One thing that's undeniable about the Spanish Civil War, Patrick, I, I don't know that you'd be familiar with this because I know no, that's not so it, much your bag. No, it's, I know quite minimal about the Spanish Civil War, in all honesty. It's pretty much a testing or proving ground, a petri dish, if you would call it anything, for various tactics and weapons platforms that would go on to be used in the Second World War. How fascinating. Like, 
I mean, I think yeah. a lot of people watching this right now is, are, is familiar with the bombing of Guernica, mm. or at the very least, they've seen Picasso's depiction yes. of the yeah. bombing of Guernica, which was truly awful. The mm. the vast majority of which were civilians. It was only on the way to the place that they really wanted to bomb. It was it was vicious, but mm. compared to the destruction that would come from the air. Mm. In the Second World War in Europe and in Asia, to be sure, Guernica was a baby taste of what would what would follow. Fascinating stuff. And so, a lot of folks on the left in the United States, Europe, they were all, you know, this was a big cause. However, there's one last thing that happens in the 30s that sends everybody in a tizzy, mm. and that tizzy is the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact also known as the Nazi-Soviet mm. Pact. Technically framed as a pact of non-aggression between Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union, but strategically, it allows Hitler to secure his eastern flank. Can you just carry on? And split it. Can you just carry on talking about that? I've got... West and, 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 and Norway. Can you carry on explaining that? I've got to disappear for five seconds. Oh, of course, no problem at all. So Fun this is life. briefly the Paul show. So let's see some of the stuff of the stuff that's been going on in chat. Ah, Vinny the Great. The movie showed us how influential Jim Crow was on the U.S. government and how it could be used for selfish purposes. On what was that? Oh, RD, RDJ has charactered it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, 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 I believe Louis Strauss was originally from Virginia. Um, so, it, you know, it's, you know, I don't have as much knowledge in that, but yeah, certainly. I mean, this, this is a big thing for a long time. And, you know, apologies, only a, yeah. people, the fun it, of live stream, you never know what's going to happen. You know, and, and even you know, we're hmm. in, only in the late 30s, we're still only a decade away from, you know, the, the Dixiecrats breaking off. Mm. And backing Strom Thurmond. So, I mean, this is something that's going on very, very real. A very serious thing at the mm. time. But we're talking about the molotov Ribbentrop Pact. And this thing is... Okay, yeah. Yeah, so basically what it, it, it claims on, on its surface, there's a secret protocol. But basically, strategically, what it allows Hitler to do is secure his eastern flank. And in the secret protocol that in the agreement that he came to with the Soviet Union, they agreed to split Poland. The Soviet Union had the ability, which they did in 1940, to occupy and annex the Baltic states. Mm. It gave them a sphere of influence over Finland, uh, as well as Bessarabia, though quite notably not northern Bukovina, but we're not getting into that part of it because that's not where we're here. No. But... The other thing about it that, that is uh, so incredible, and we're not going to get into this, in fact, back in season three, when Robert uh, guest yes. hosted, when, yeah. when you were moving, of all things, yes, yeah. we actually did a, a whole middle segment that talked about this a great deal. Mm. So if you go into the episode of why did the Roman economy fail in the third century, if you go into the middle segment there, somebody asked us a question about ultimately how did... Hitler fooled Stalin, and the molotov Ribbentrop Pact is very central to that. So if you're at all interested, go back and give a listen to that, because we do it for about a half an hour. Hmm. Robert is also a heavyweight when it comes to the Second World War. Yeah. Get into more of that. But politically, and this is where things start getting really dicey, is that for a lot of socialists or communists, especially American ones or hmm. ones that are in Western Europe— a lot of their association with socialism and communism is that it's anti-fascist. Yes. And that's and, not particularly And how the case can you too. have this cause that you're fighting for ultimately shacking up with them? Because there's a lot of covert cooperation between mm. the two. You know, there's at least two major trade packs between those two powers that they hammer out at the time. It also included um, 
a, a great deal of exchange in return for proprietary military technologies that were created by German companies, things of that nature. And so that sent everyone in the tizzy. And as far as, like, for example, American Trotskyists, a lot of them fall out with Leon Trotsky, who only lives another year from that point because he's assassinated in 1940 mm. with the infamous axe down in Mexico City because he supports it. Mm. You know, the, this ultimate champion against Stalin says, yeah, that was the thing to do. Mm. And he even predicted it. So, so there's a lot of stuff going on there. And as far as where Oppenheimer falls in it, he eventually actually kind of loses interest in the mm. Spanish Civil War. He's like, there are other causes that require my attention. Yes, yeah. And he also does give apparently a good deal of money to organizations that are helping uh, Jews in Nazi Germany during the 30s as yeah. well. Which, yeah. Great stuff, yeah, <laughs> totally. I mean, I don't think there's any arguing with the, no. with the validity of that. So. So just carrying on our sort of through our notes and whatnot, I'm curious to know. You've already delved greatly into the sort of historical context of where does this he fall film. into all of this? Where does he fall into this? Yes, that is a question that historians are still dealing with. <laughs> Brilliant, because the FBI literally was following him up the wazoo, not just yeah. when he became a potential candidate for the position that he would ultimately take over in the uh, Manhattan Engineering District, also known as the Manhattan Project. Mm. But because he was surrounded by so many of these folks. And one thing that, you know, J. Edgar Hoover loved doing more than anything else. And he had a very interesting life, if you're familiar with him. Mm. From very early on, he took extreme pleasure and interest in rooting out communism and communist subversion in the United States. This wasn't something that just happened at the dawn of the Cold War and McCarthyism. No, 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 no. J. Edgar Hoover was OG. <laughs> he was doing it before it was cool. <laughs> with a passion, yeah. might I add. With a passion. Gosh. So, so there, But the thing is that as much as the FBI investigated him... They would tap his phones. Mm. They would tail him. And he knew this, too. They weren't and we even, see that in the film. Yeah. And they were not even that, they were not even that discreet about it. No. Because he, he knew it. Like, he, he would be talking to uh, his wife or, um, or Jean Tatlock, for example. We'll talk about her in a minute because she's yeah. one of the, the main definite members of CPUSA that mm. was very close to him. He, he'd be like, yeah, you hear that clicking on the phone? Yeah, that, that's that's the FBI tap. They just hung up. Yeah, yeah. So from a, a biographer's perspective, considering now this is all open information, information. just go, go to the Library of Congress. You can get the whole file if you yeah. want. Yeah, gosh. Nothing conclusive came from it in terms of his actual and official, certainly, association. In fact... Based on what I could see and and the his kind of reaction to how things went on, while he definitely considered some on the far left what he would call fellow travelers, mm. he was never that he, he always was turned off by the party line. Mm. He was never interested in being dictated to by the party. No, he was just curious about it. Very much so. Yeah. And so despite everything that happened and all the innuendo and all of the various affiliations he had and how he came into it, nothing conclusive. No. And that that still stands. He, and you know, that's, he, yeah. He's a sphinx as everything else. You know, he's a sphinx. That's kind of like how the film – spoilers. That's kind of the conclusion of the film after the um, trials and whatnot. He, they, they say they don't think he's communist, they don't think he's a threat. They still take away security clearance for different separate reasons. But but that's, that's later a, on, that's after the yeah, war. That, yeah, that's way after the war and whatnot. But yeah, like, it's just interesting how much that dogged him. Those allegations from way back then dogged him his entire life during the Trinity testing, way after the war and whatnot. I just find that really interesting. Something else I'm curious about. Yeah, it has. In regards to, we've established yourself and myself, we have uh, knowledge of the background of this film uh, we, we we understand the actual history open behind it 
And do you think having knowledge of real world history sort of spoils or enhances this film? I personally think knowing knowing the basic plot beats of Oppenheimer's life, of the Trinity testing, of the dropping of the atomic bomb, that has that has superbly enhanced my view and experience. I, I I thought it was great. I think I personally think I would have been quite lost if I didn't know some of the stuff going into this anyway. I'm just curious to know your thoughts. I mean, it's one of those cases where kind of reading the book, for lack of a better term, before seeing the film actually kind of benefits. Due to pure happenstance, mm. I ended up seeing this film with two friends of mine, mm -hmm. both of whom I hold in the highest esteem. Mm -hmm. One of which that was quite familiar with all of this history in detail. Mm -hmm. And the other... <sighs> who had very little knowledge going Doing some great it. scientific testing here. Purely by a happenstance, <laughs> to be sure. And from what I can tell is that it, without more knowledge, the film can be a bit more impenetrable. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of where I would have been. I, mean, I have no idea what's going on here. It doesn't really hold your hand in a lot of aspects. Well, here's an example I'll give you mm. from my own experience. And that is Klaus Fuchs. Yes. In the film, as you may recall, Nolan just kind of slips him in there. Yeah. It's like if, if you, if you, you know, got lost on a thought or you blunk your eye, whatever the situation was, Patrick... It happened so fast and so sly, and that was so intentional. And unless you knew who Klaus Fuchs was, mm. it would have totally gone over your head. Yeah, I, that was an aspect I wasn't familiar with. I didn't know he was a um, spy or any capacity like that. He wasn't the only one. No. I think he was one of two actual scientists. Maybe there was a third Obviously, none of them were familiar with the fact that they were cooperating with Soviet mm. intelligence, the NKVD, the GRU, whatever the case is. And then, of course, you have the other fellow who's part of this to an extent. I believe he was serving in the Army Corps of Engineers, which is David Greenglass, mm. who was, I believe, the brother of a name that you are most certainly going to be familiar with. The name with. rings a bell, Paul Greengrass. <laughs> uh, no, it's uh, <laughs> the David, director? David Greenglass. Oh, apologies. I was being stupid. Greenglass. <laughs> we have that live on audio. We can't cut that out, my stupidity. <laughs> I believe he was the brother of Ethel Rosenberg. The name rings a bell, Ethel Rosenberg. Ethel and Julius Rosenberg. They, they were the ones that passed on the atomic secrets and ended oh, up getting okay, then. the electric chair. Oh, okay then. In the early 50s. Mm. Which actually brought an interesting question, the fact that you never actually hear the name Rosenberg ever come up in all of no, this, despite no. the fact that you get into the, the hysteria of the early uh, mm. Red Scare of the 50s. Not the first Red Scare, of course, but the 50s Red Scare. Mm. But if you if if you even blink and you don't know who he is, it's gone. Yeah, but it's that piece that's in there that if you know what you're looking for, that's that a big deal. And <laughs> and the interesting Sorry. thing about him was is that he was he was a German Jew. He hmm. was actually part of the contingent that was ultimately brought over to the Manhattan Project provided by Great Britain, hmm. and he was passing on Secret Society, and boy, did he play his role well. Yeah. Nobody suspected him. No. In fact, there was this one really, really fantastic uh, interrogator. I, it was either for MI5 or MI6 that got him to confess by just taking long walks with him and just having various discussions and eventually just kind of coaxing out a confession. Mm. Of course, when the same guy tried to do roughly the same thing to Kim Philby a few years later, he fell flat on his face. That's Kim Philby was, was a master for better and, and worse, but we're not getting into Kim Philby right now. No. Anyway, so that would be a perfect example of the kind of thing you're talking about. So I definitely think there are elements of this, unless you have a, a more 
more insight into some of the minutia of the film and the yeah. history involved, there's stuff that you're just going to miss. I think it, this is a really weird analogy in some ways, but it reminds me of the Marvel movies in some ways where mm. you can enjoy them. But if you've read the comics and you know the history of Marvel, you're going to pick up on little things, little Easter eggs, little references that people who aren't as familiar with it will enjoy. It's kind of the historical equivalent of that, I suppose. If you know, yeah. you know. If you know, you know. So, you yeah, we both are in agreement about that kind of just knowing the history of this film doesn't ruin it by any means. If you're scared of spoilers, um, the, the, there's not really much to spoil. Uh, knowing the spoilers, knowing the plot enhances it terrifically. Vinnie the Great, I was very confused by your first comment about Jim Crow laws. I was like, what has Jim Crow laws got to do with this? That he, makes more he, sense he when we mentioned Jim Crow with yeah. McCarthyism. Yeah, I just saw his follow up comment. Okay, yeah, but thank you. When, when you get this McCarthyism, that makes a ton of sense. You're very right. It has a huge impact on day to day life in the, the after USA. After the war, and after the war yeah. Let's put, it, let's put it this way, Vinnie. Mm. You're still the great to us. Yes, definitely, definitely. So no Don't, worries. We, there. we all make mistakes. So what? And, some and the... just thank you for you know just coming mm. here and watching and contributing. We we love hearing yes. from you guys. Yeah, right? we love all the comments so far. But something that really is important here, mm. and we'll get to the 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 last act, the major act, that really in so many ways defines the film with the loss of the security clearance and mm. the, the public hand wringing, and. That is, of course, Los Alamos. Mm. And so we have to ask ourselves a question. How does a guy that has never had, prior to that, any experience directing in this sort of way this many people on a, a single task? Yes, you know, he, he builds up a program, you know, at, at UC Berkeley for theoretical physics. But th this is... This is something else. And this mm. is kind of an interesting point because this is where I will say I will take some umbrage with the film. Okay, yes, yeah, so that's what I want to get onto. Some that we've talked General about. Which Le is Leslie Groves. Yeah, so we've talked a lot about all the things they got right from a historical perspective. There's so many great little details going. Just something I want to mention quickly. In our atomic bomb video, we talked about why Kyoto wasn't bombed. And that fact the fact that one of the generals honeymoon there and that's that's like the sole reason they chose not to bomb it or a key reason that's mentioned in this film that got a little chuckle a very morbid chuckle out of me i suppose like, huh, i knew about I that it's it. in the yeah. film i Old felt Colonel acknowledged Simpson, in a the, weird way the, the u.s secretary of war yeah so that, i want to hear about Oppenheimer apparently was also on the target committee oh okay that makes sense as well but yeah. um yeah, I want to hear about some of the things that we want to talk about, some of the things that weren't as historically accurate. And you've told me um, in an email, Matt Damon's uh, General Groves character, you said you're much more familiar with the history than I am, especially on some of the wider characters of all this. So you said you took a bit of umbrage with him. It's it, it a little bit nitpicky because, you, mm. you know. That's what we're he, here he, for. He, he, well, <laughs> it's some time. But here, here, okay, so who is Leslie Groves? Other than being in charge of the Manhattan engineering district where mm. did this guy even come from and he's an interesting guy because he, he's the son of an army chaplain mm. who ends up deciding that he wants to go into the army himself his father ends up souring on the idea of his son going into the army but the young leslie Groves wants to get to west point he actually ends up going and getting into, I believe, MIT mm. for a short time, and then he transfers into uh, the U.S. Military Academy, also known as West Point, after which he ends up becoming part of the Army Corps of Engineers. Okay? Mm -hmm. And this guy, he's not quite a martinet, but boy, is he single-minded. Mm -hmm. And he is interested in one thing and one thing only from the beginning of his career. When he, especially when he starts getting ranking up high enough where he starts being able to inherit some projects here. And that is, he's all about getting the job done. This is the guy they put in charge of building the Pentagon <laughs> during World War II. Yeah. And in, in the film, he kind of comes off as like, a straight man, for lack of a better term. He's seen, seen sort of quite stern, but often like the butt of jokes in many ways. That sort of classic stern army goof in a couple of ways. That's kind of how he's portrayed in the film, but he was a lot more than that. Yeah, and actually that was the thing that I, I was kind of eh mm. about. 
because while he was not a martinet, he was very seriously minded. Mm. And he, you know, he actually, when it came to jokes, if one of his subordinates made a joke, he looked down on that. He oh, yeah. I can't even make that up. Yeah. Um, you know, he wasn't, I, from what I ever think I can tell, he, he was not like some foul mouth brute. He was just very, very serious. Mm. You know, he did not give compliments or encouragements easily. His feelings were, you did a good job because that's what you were supposed to do. You know, mm. you're not going to get a high five for doing your job the best way you should be able to do it. Mm. So this is the guy they put in charge of the Pentagon, and they built the Pentagon. <laughs> yeah, yeah. By, by the time he even gets to the Manhattan Engineering District, he's already handled over $8 billion of federal funds in various projects that he had been put in charge of. And you can calculate that out for inflation over on the inflation calculator. If you go into yeah. Google, just, just put in 1941 or 42 as a good rough yeah. estimate. Put in $8 billion. And then put it in today's dollars and yeah. realize it would be even more than that today. Yeah. Uh, despite the number you get. And the thing that's interesting about him is the fact that he is so drawn to Robert Oppenheimer. Mm. And the question that, based on all the candidates that they ultimately interview, the big question is why? Why him? Why him? And it's, it's pretty, I wouldn't say it's simple, but it, it's interesting because this guy is an engineer. Yeah. Yet at the same time, he still kind of comes off, and this is not just the movie, this is also in, in various very credible writing and histories mm. on the subject. He very much needed a an interpreter. Mm -hmm. And so he met a number of potential directors that would, potentially fill the slot that Oppenheimer did, but he couldn't understand a damn thing they were saying to him. He'd walk away yeah. just like, okay, yeah, I'm not going to be working with this person. Mm. But when he encounters Oppenheimer, he is so impressed by how well he's able to boil down and explain these incredibly complicated concepts and make it digestible where it doesn't simplify it or oversimplify it and still communicates all of the very important elements that this is a part of and that it needs to be a part of and what he needs to understand. So even after he meets Oppenheimer, he still meets a whole bunch of other folks. And hmm. still in a sense, like, this Oppenheimer guy, this is, this is the guy I want to work with. Well, that's the skill. Like, I'm saying anyone could be highly intelligent, but obviously not anyone could be highly intelligent. But like, there's a big distinction between like just being clever, but also being clever and being able to explain, like be able to explain succinctly your ideas, be able to communicate that. It's, it's the term that science communicators. And Oppenheimer had that ability, which so many other great scientists haven't really had then you know you don't get famous by just being a scientist in some many ways you get the, the ones who are more well known your einsteins your oppenheimers they're the ones who had this capability to um ele be elegant with their words and communicate the science they were talking about turing once again is another prime example of that yes and the the amazing thing about their relationship which is outlined very well in one of the books mm. that i consulted in preparing for this which was called the genius and the general Mm. very much focuses on their collaboration. Oh, okay then. First thing to really establish here, Oppenheimer was working for Groves. Yes. And the other way around. No, it, the film, I think, often makes it seem like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah mm. that's not unfair. No, yeah. The other thing is, and this is something else that Groves notices, is that this Oppenheimer fellow... He is going to make the recruiting process, which is always already going to be extremely difficult, mm. a lot smoother. And it wasn't mm. that smooth anyway. No. Because at the end of the day, they looked at a bunch of sites that could have housed this portion of the Manhattan Project. And let's be clear, this is also mentioned to some degree in the film. But if I remember correctly, and we, we talk about security in this case and making sure of and wartime security for a top secret project, compartmentalization. 
it's not just a matter of having clearance to know mm. something. You also have to have a a clearly outlined and approved need to know something. So security was always a very important thing here, which is one of the reasons why they were going to set this thing up in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. What I understand, you have about 200,000 people working on this. Gosh. As a whole. The film, yeah. Los the Alamos, mm. Hanford, Washington, Oak Ridge, Tennessee. You also have a lot of the material um, experimentation uh, as far as the material science happening at the University of Chicago, and I believe Princeton may even be involved in this. You see well. very minimal of that in the film. You only really see Los Alamos. And that, once again, ties into the fact that this is so clearly Oppenheimer's perspective. If he wasn't there, you're not really going to see it. Yeah, and something else is that both Gro Groves was not at Los Alamos 24-7. He's going no. back and forth to Washington and having a meeting in Chicago and Washington Tennessee. Even Oppenheimer is traveling around and handling all of these things. You mm. know, one of the biggest contributors to the scientists in the Manhattan Project for somebody that is now beyond famous, of course, is Enrico Fermi. Yes. His contribution is mostly happening up at the University of Chicago. And, of course, if you're familiar with the Fermi paradox, mm. same Enrico Fermi. <laughs> yeah. So... They're not there all the time, but they know they're going to have to set this thing up in the middle of nowhere. And he knows that Oppenheimer is going to be able to recruit and, you know, basically get these people on board. Because the living conditions out there in Alamogordo, up on the hill, where they ultimately, the hill is what they considered, you know, mm. Mesa, more or less, where this is all going on, it's still going to be hard living. You know, the... Oppenheimer does everything possible to to get as much out of Groves as possible in terms of improving quality of life for people that are going to be mostly isolated out there. It's not that you can't leave; you're allowed to to leave the the, the center, the episode, you know, the control portion of the camp, mm. go up to Santa Fe, whatever the case may be. But you have a lot of single men. You have a lot mm. of families. You have some single women that are working there. Not. And I do mean that in a scientific role, not like mm. an administrative secretary. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Even the, though that the, was also certainly going on. The film covers that. I think there. I can't remember her name, but there is a sort of there's a scene about one of the female scientists who were part of the team. Yeah, and mm. so this is a really good example of how you you where you're beginning to really see that Oppenheimer charisma that was totally absent early in his life, mm. where people are so drawn to him, so loyal to him. Once again, just this charismatic leadership. We're not, mm. we're obviously, we're not talking about a lark in this case, but we're talking about Oppenheimer. This is another example in many ways of charismatic leadership. Mm. They're drawn to his personality in so many ways, and he has so many connections. And one of the ways, of course, he ends up really pitching to these folks that give us your time, give us your energy, make the sacrifice, because we're trying to beat out the Germans. Yeah. That we cannot let that happen. And that's one of the big driving point points of the film is how far have the Germans come along with their bomb? And it gets revealed that they aren't anywhere near as far as the Americans were as the Americans initially thought they were going to be. But that's a big factor behind this well, film. Well the Germans. The mm. Germans are not as far as they thought they so, were. So that's what I meant. Yeah, but the Germans were yeah. And that's part of the that really fun video that you and I did last mm. year. Did the U.S. have to drop the atomic mm. bombs in World War II is that for most of the war, the Allies didn't know just how behind the Germans were. Mm. But since nuclear, first, you know, successful nuclear fission mm. occurs in 1938 in Germany, which is smack dab in the Nazi regime era. Yeah. This is a very dangerous thing. That and Werner Heisenberg is still sitting there. Mm. And we can talk more about him another time. Yes, definitely, but definitely. They're they're very much worried about this, and they should be. Yeah. They absolutely should be. And the thing about the Manhattan Project and this whole scope is that in many ways, it was really only the United States and the Soviet Union that had the resources and theoretical capacity to undertake this particular well, this particular undertaking. Yeah. You literally needed an entire nation e economy behind mm. you. 
And luckily, you know, the United States, uh, <clears throat> we ended up getting known as the arsenal of democracy. I, no. I checked. No, you guys have, you guys have, you, your, your war chest is pretty well covered, to say the least. Yes, and, you know, we're producing all sorts of things, of mm. course. But uh, the United States really, even at that, is really the only folks who could pull this off. Yeah. Speaking of pulling it off, what did you think of the Trinity test scene? I thought that was an absolute that that was i said despite how much of this film is about the communist allegations that kind of scene alone kind of brings it all back and that's the scene a lot of people are there to see the actual testing of the atomic bomb supposedly minimal cgi was used in the explosion itself apparently it was done through miniatures and camera tricks what did you think of that whole scene i thought it was absolutely spectacular between the use of lighting the bomb itself sound the the, the time between the sight and the sound reflecting the speed of light versus the speed of sound itself. I thought it was wonderful. I find it amazing mm. that we now live a period in time in filmmaking, major motion picture mm. filmmaking, where 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago, special effects, CGI, mm. were the ultimate flex. Totally, it's kind of Today, gone full circle. It's gone full circle where being able to pull off something like that entirely using practical effects. I think there was the minimal CGI involved. I don't think it was completely practical. I'm not, I've heard conflict. They haven't revealed how it was fully done, but um, it's still amazing. The like, truth I, will come out. Yeah. And going back to Barbie, that's one of the, I was reading an article about the two films. That's one of the reasons. <laughs> oh, there's a whiplash. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> it's one of the reasons these two films are thriving so, because people are just bored of CGI, just like drivel, like going back to the Marvel movies as well. They're just sort of like these green screen look like they're filmed in a cupboard half the time. Um, I think Oppenheimer is very proud of its practical effects and Barbie likewise used a ton of practical old school effects. That's what people is just resonating with people at the moment. No, that whole scene was wonderful. Very, very, very breathtaking. It was an immense feat mm. of filmmaking. Mm. Christopher Nolan, goodness gracious, my friend. And there goodness was some... gracious. And there were some really terrific sort of Nolan touches because this is a Nolan film after all. He's got his sort of yeah. signature things. The way the, chrono the chronology of the film was interesting. It kind of flitted between timelines and the black and white aspects um, highlighted, as we mentioned, the parts that weren't Oppenheimer's perspective. Edited f fantastically. It was just, you could tell this was a very well-crafted film from a director who is quite into his films, I'd say. <laughs> he is one of the greats. Yeah. I think, in, in, the, in the prime of his career, mm, that's totally. something to savor. And I think one of the last things, which for the last sort of 20 minutes or so. Well, of... there's one thing I do want oh, to touch sorry, on, carry first, on though, mm. because this is so important. Okay, so I carry on. About the Trinity test. Oh, okay. So that particular device they called the gadget. And you hear that term in the film. Yes. In fact,. Even the Soviets later on, a couple decades later, when they were in, they were in Cuba, mm. and the Cuban Missile Crisis is going on, they all refer to the nuclear weapons that are on the island down there as the gadget. <laughs> just, just something to put. Yeah. Up. This thing, and in this case, let's be clear, you got the two different types of atomic bombs. Yes. You have the, the one from the uranium two thirty five. And you also have the one that's plutonium, one that's the 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 gunshot one, which is the hmm. uranium-235, which all the scientists that were involved there were so confident was going to work. Hmm. The plutonium implosion device, which is the one they tested at Trinity, hmm. that, that was the outlier. Mm -hmm. This thing was a science experiment. I, yeah. I, I mean, I, I, mean I, I can't put it in any better way. We have... Nuclear weapons now, after the better part of a century, living with them yeah. every day as just a fact of life, and they've become more refined mm. and everything you could imagine. We know what that's about. Mm. The gadget, 
was a freaking science experiment. They had no idea what was actually going to happen with it. It kind of really well encapsulates that sort of fact that we have no idea what's going on. Obviously, us with history on our side, we know how this is going to play. There's the whole part about lighting. Yeah. Yeah. There's the whole thing about lighting the atmosphere on fire. And I was sitting there thinking like, well, unless Nolan really changes the history, we know that's not going to happen. But um, that was actually one of the more interesting comedic moments. Yeah. I mean, it's like, comedic well, to us, I guess, because we know it's not going to happen. And it was also intention, intentionally somewhat comedic mm. for for the benefit of the audience and that exchange between Oppenheimer and Groves. Yeah. Which is that when Groves brings up the fact, like, the, the whole very outside possibility that this thing could just keep going and it just pop off mm. the atmosphere, say, you know, say goodbye to all, all life on Earth. Yeah. And... Oppenheimer says to him very casually, well, based on our work and our predictions, it's not a non-zero chance. Yeah, yeah. And of course, you know, Groves being as high strung as he was, they're both very high strung, by, by the way, Yeah. in many ways. Um, they, that's where, it's kind of like this, this funny moment because cause Groves is not comfortable with non-zero chance. That this guy is there to get a job done. Mm. And you know, just kind of wrapping a bow on on the whole collaboration between Oppenheimer and Groves. Groves went out on a very big limb mm. for Oppenheimer. That shows just how badly they wanted him. Mm. Specifically, Groves wanted him. Apparently, and I can't make this up. This was this was in the Ray Monk lecture at IAS. Yes, which you can find on YouTube. Very yeah. interesting stuff is that, once again, our, our old friend uh, J. Edgar Hoover basically pleaded with Groves, you cannot give this guy a security clearance. Look at the people mm. around him. Because even though at that point in time, and the war is still going on, obviously, we're just talking about like late 42, early 43, mm. and Britain, the United States, and the Soviet Union, the Western Allies are in a shotgun military coalition with the Soviets. Mm. And while the Cold War was not what one would necessarily call inevitable, there was certainly a lot of momentum building towards that mm. in time because especially by the time you get to early 43, that's that's when you see the surrender of the German Sixth Army at Stalingrad, then back then later on in the in July, you see the Wehrmacht just, you know, basically break most of its back at the Kursk salient. Mm. They're going to lose the freaking war. Question is, how long is it going to take, and what's the investment in lives that's going to require? Mm. And in terms of just the calculation of how this war was fought in Europe against Germany, because this was a Germany first policy, right? And this was something that was even established with the United States and Great Britain in secret about mm. nine or ten months before the United States ends up entering the war, which is that if the United States is brought into this and they find themselves at war with both Imperial Japan and the European Axis, most prominently Nazi Germany, the focus strategically will be on Nazi mm. Germany. And so for, for th this part, despite all of that, yeah, the Cold War is coming. Mm. And so security, especially when you're dealing with a situation where, and they show this in the film, this is one of what Oppenheimer publicly admitted was one of his great failures. I don't know whether publicly admitted, but he definitely admitted it, which is the very classic interaction between his friend and colleague, Hawken, Chevalier, who mm. was a colleague, I believe, with him at it was either Caltech or or uh, Cal Berkeley, where he approaches him in the kitchen during like kind of a dinner party, and asks Oppenheimer if he'd be interested in passing on information of use to the Soviets. Mm. And the thing that made he tried to turn him down, mm. but. The thing that Oppenheimer said is one of his biggest regrets is that when Groves asked him for the very first time if that had something like that had ever happened, I think it was even 
specifically mentioning Chevalier. He, Oppenheimer said, I will only tell you if you order me. Mm -hmm. And Groves did not push the issue. And when he later found out that basically the way Groves was kind of looking at it was kind of a, a schoolboy attitude of you, you don't want to out your friends. You don't want to be a tattletale. There's a lot yeah. more at stake here, but that's just kind of how he looked at it. So even J. Edgar Hoover basically saying, do not give this guy access <laughs> to, you know, a map down the street. Mm. Groves goes out and limp for <laughs> And does it anyway. He does it anyway. Why? Because this is the thing that needs to be done now. And that's the thing that makes Groves so single-minded. It's also the thing that makes Oppenheimer so single-minded. Mm. They're both very ambitious, they're very single-minded, and they're working towards the same goal. And they build this thing out there in New Mexico. The gadget is mm. a science experiment. And I cannot emphasize enough, Patrick... <sighs> How incredible it is that I, I believe this thing was successfully tested. Trinity happened, I think, on the 18th of July of yeah. 1945. Yeah. That less than a month later, they used, one of them was a duplicate, of course, a potato device that they yeah. dropped on Nagasaki, that they turned them into functional weapons. Well, yeah. It doesn't Science really go into much, yeah. yeah. That, that's a very hard thing yeah. to do. I mean, it doesn't really it, it's incredible go into stuff. that detail, yeah. Yeah, like, yeah. You see yeah, the Trinity absolutely. test, then all of a sudden they're being shipped up and sent away. You don't even see, you don't see the bombing in Japan as much. You see kind of Oppenheimer's mental state. He kind of envisions a young woman in front of him with her skin deteriorating. Imagine some sort of charred remains on his feet, but you don't see anything directly. And that once again, that ties into um, how this is Oppenheimer's narrative, his first person perspective that yeah. he wouldn't have seen that himself or he would have only heard it on the radio. So that's only how we really hear about it as well. It's just fascinating stuff. So I think for the last 10 minutes or so, I want to just talk about some of the characters and the actors who portrayed them. What did you think of uh, Killian Murphy, Cillian Murphy, Killian Murphy as Oppenheimer? I think he he was born give, for the give, role. Give, give him the Oscar now. Yeah. There's no, was, there's no competition here. I mean, physically, he was born for the role. He looks strikingly like him. He was just terrific. I think this is the first time he's been a lead role in a big movie like this. He's been in previous Nolan stuff before. I think he was in the three Batman films Nolan did. He might have been in might have been in some of his other films. Nothing's coming to mind for me right now. But it was great seeing him finally get his dues, I guess, in a big film like this. Opposite so many other bleeding men. Robert Downey Jr. was in this film. Matt and Damon women. was into it. And women, of course. All of these other people are probably much more well-known of uh, actors than uh, Killian Murphy. So to see him rise above them was amazing. I, I don't think Killian Murphy's method. Mm, I don't no. think his method, which is, 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 and, and some, in some capacities has become, it has been for a, quite a while now, I imagine, kind of a, a, a dirty, dirty word in, in Hollywood just because... Mm. Method actors can be a, a little, little much. Thank you, Vinny. The great is telling me that uh, he was in Inception as well. Thank you very much. Ba you're back to being great again. <laughs> he never stopped. He never stops. He never. And he never stopped. <laughs> anyway, you give him the Oscar now. I mean, yeah. just, come on, just let's move. you know, the more cynical among us are going to say, "Oh, well, you know, Oppenheimer was just just Oscar bait." Mm. So no, this, this is better than just <laughs> yeah. Oscar bait. This mm. is this is a blockbuster epic mm. that is so very well close to the actual history. Yeah, that you and I, as students of history, as presenters of history, can say, of history. "Yeah, wow!" Especially when you have to, after last time, having to decode the hot historical garbage that was the imitation game. <laughs> I'm still, I'm, I'm still, still scarred. After yeah, that. I'm still scarred by Gladiator when um, the Roman Empire came to an end and it came back to go back to being a republic. Oh my that's, god, <laughs> that's still yeah, scarring it's me. Just, it's just silly. Uh, it's yeah, just silly stuff. Anyway, but no, he was terrific. I also, despite not being entirely historically accurate, I really enjoyed Matt Damon in it. I think as as a character, devoid he does a good of job the with real. Gross. Yeah, he, he was does. really great. So despite fun. despite you know some of the, him being more used for humor even mm. though in re, in reality gross was quite humorless yeah but that's he, where the humor derives from i guess levity, yeah you know he's just yeah. there for some levity and i get that and i once again 
uh, we haven't really talked about him too much, but Robert Downey Jr., it, this is like his first big role since ending the Iron Man Marvel stuff. And I think he even said himself he kind of forgot how to act for 10 years or so because the Marvel stuff wasn't yeah, yeah. too demanding of him in many ways. He's really great in this film. He's an absolute paranoid, just... He's primarily, I guess, for lack of a word, he's the antagonist of this piece, especially once it becomes more of a courtroom drama. It's revealed that he's the one pulling the strings and whatnot. And that all, it all comes down to one conversation he missed out on. And that's where his paranoia descends into madness from. And that was just great. And Danny Jr. did terrific with that character. There's a scene, though, I want to bring up here. Mm. Because I, I think for any longer time or, or truly OG, <laughs> AD history, you know, fan, mm. follower, part of Odo's AD of fight army, if if only in spirit, mm. is the scene they show with Oppenheimer in the White House with Harry Truman. Yes. And I would say at least in spirit, one moment. That's okay. Was just sort of sort of got some technical issues right now. Uh, as we've declared, this is some of the fun stuff. We don't know what's going on right now. This is our first ever live stream. We're just yeah. it could all come to pieces at any moment. Absolutely, and mm. and just given we still need a little time to wrap this up. Mm. Just given the the battery on my camera right now, I know yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna be end up transferring over to my, my webcam. So sorry, yes, it's a little janky here. Yeah, I apologize in advance. Anyway, this particular episode is actually outlined extremely well in David McCullough's just truly epic biography, mm. Truman. And I would say in spirit, this particular meeting as it was portrayed in the film was generally accurate. And though mm. Truman did call Oppenheimer a crybaby if you know, for sitting there, talking about having blood on his hands, mm. basically using the President of the United States, the Commander-in-Chief, as his father confessor. I have no idea what got <laughs> into his mind to think that no. was something that was ever going to work out well. You couldn't deal with... The, couldn't mm. be two more different human beings than Harry no. Truman and Robert Oppenheimer. Let's, let's say this. Both extremely intelligent. You know, don't, let, don't let Harry mm. Truman's folksy personality fool you. That man was sharp. It, yeah, I, he did. He did. He did not suffer a fool, including it was, himself. Yeah. It was only afterwards my dad was like, "Oh, Gary Oldman was good." I was like, "Gary Oldman was in that film." I I didn't realize until afterwards that he was playing uh, Truman. It's interesting to think that he has now portrayed two leaders of, yes. the, of the Western Allies. Of at course, this point. yeah. Just get him a that, Stalin, and then we're good to go. <laughs> well, in any case, I don't believe he ever actually called him a crybaby to his no. face. But Jimmy Burns, who was Truman's first Secretary of State, and Truman, I believe, had three. So you had mm. Jimmy Burns, you had George Marshall, and you had Dean Acheson. When the meeting was over, well, the first thing he that Truman said to him was, you know, it was my decision to do this. Mm. This is on me, and we all have blood on our hands. Mm. And then once he very hurriedly you know, got that meeting over with, he basically said, you know, Jimmy Burns, what a crybaby. I don't want that man mm. in my office ever again. Mm. And this is really important because in, in the film, it comes off almost callous without a bit more context of what's going on with Harry Truman. Mm. Now, let's be clear about this. 80 history is based fundamentally on... Nothing in history was inevitable. Yes. But there are some things that you just look at it and you say, wow, there was definitely momentum there that it was a, a, a very high probability outcome. Mm. Whether it was Harry Truman or whether Roosevelt had lived long enough that the decision fell on him, they were both going to make the same decision. Mm. I mean, heck, Roosevelt is the one who more or less initiated this thing. And they wanted to do everything possible to end the war. They didn't know mm. that the atomic bombs were going to help encourage that outcome definitively. No, they just wanted it done with. And of course, the Soviets invaded Manchuria, which they did by agreement mm. after both Yalta and, and then, of course, Potsdam. 
But, but, in later years, because Harry Truman is a fantastic subject for a biographer, mm. because he just wrote so many letters to his wife, to his family, to his daughter, to his friends. Later on, he was, you know, seen reflecting in a, in a very remorseful state about all of the kids that never got a chance to grow up mm. that were in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, who were completely innocent. I, I swear I heard this. This might be one of those stories you hear. Hadn't Hiroshima and Nagasaki kind of had lots of children come to there because they hadn't been that damaged during the war anyway? I know Tokyo was horrendously firebombed, so a lot of those kids were evacuated to those cities anyway. I don't know how much truth there was in that. There, could, kind be of, a, is, there could be a good... Yeah. I, I, I can't say for certain, but it would make no. a hell of a lot of sense. It's something I've heard which just makes it even more morbid. You know, it, well, yeah. And I mean... Mm. If you ask Curtis LeMay what the biggest problem for him late in the war in terms of bombing Japan, mm. mainland, yeah, he was running out of targets. Yeah. Interesting problem in wartime. Yeah, yeah not enough targets to hit. In so, addition to that, as far as Truman goes, though, as far as Truman goes, he also, in time, privately just, you know, he he had to deal with it himself. Hmm. The weight of, of that decision, exactly, and you know he was he was a man who very much believed in a high a power higher than himself. Hmm. And he thought that you know he, he he may have to may have to answer for that at some point. That's just who he was. Hmm. And so when he's approached by Oppenheimer, and I'm looking into this knowing the, the greater picture here with the benefit of hindsight. I think one of the reasons why he was so bothered by the Oppenheimer interaction is because it must have struck a nerve of something that was already going, inside, going on inside of him mm -hmm. to be approached like that. I mean, how do you handle something like that, Patrick? No idea. It's no. almost like in it's some beyond us. Yeah, it, from Oppenheimer's perspective, this how sounds strange. It was in in kind of some ways Truman was trying to comfort him, being like, "I was the one who made that decision. Don't you worry about it." Which is it's almost like in a weird roundabout way, trying to take the burden off of someone's shoulders in a very ham-fisted way. I feel. And that was the thing, though, about mm. Oppenheimer, is that he did a lot of public hand wringing. Mm. And he's been criticized over that ever since. Mm. If you remember Louis Strauss, who unfortunately in, in, in this, this episode of AD History Watches, we won't really be able to get so much to that. No. Because, you know, we, we, we've only set aside so much time for this. Yes, but yeah. We can answer questions about it later if mm. you listening or watching, whether it be live right now or later when it is syndicated onto the podcast directories in its audio only form, mm. though we wish we had you today. Yeah. <laughs> is that for the most part, a lot of people felt that in his own right, it was almost like he was doing it for his own ego. Mm. And more to the point, Later on, when he was asked, I was watching an interview with him earlier today. I think it was, I believe it was in 1963, no, 64, 63 or 64, a couple of years before he died, if he regretted what he had done at Los Alamos with the bomb, his feeling was that it was necessary mm. and he would not change it. I guess it's you, if if you're faced with that scenario, if you start second guessing yourself, what are you even gonna do? Like, I w you just gotta go stick to your guns and be like, no, that's how it is. I because if you start doubting it, you're just gonna drive yourself up the wall. Yes, and yeah. I, and I'm not denying the veracity mm. of the guilt that he felt, mm. but I can say that he did have a lot of critics. Mm to that end. 
And once again, we'll, if the audience is interested, you mm. listening or watching, wherever you may be listening or watching, live or later on, want to ask us questions about that specifically, be sure to email us at 80historypodcast at tgnreview.com. Once again, that's 80historypodcast yeah. at tgnreview.com. You can also tweet it at us at 80historypc. Send us a a comment or mm. a direct message at facebook.com slash 80 history podcast or instagram.com slash 80 history podcast. And we will definitely get back to that. But like, so you, you know, we obviously have limited time here today. Yeah. Before we wrap up, I just really want to highlight Emily Blunt's Kitty Oppenheimer and Florence Pugh's Jane Tatlock. Two fantastic uh, I roles. I mean, this, this film is yeah. so large. How do you get to yeah. all of it in 90 minutes? I know. I just think she, Emily Blunt in particular was terrific because Kitty Oppenheimer had a very unpleasant, tortured life. And it kind of captures that every now and then. There's that one scene after the Trinity test where it cuts back to Kitty Oppenheimer at home with the two screaming children and she just looks exhausted. And it's just a fantastic reminder of what the, the families behind these people were going through. They had their, their own stuff going on at that time. And it's just a great reminder of that. And Jean Tatlock was a really troubled soul in so many ways it's hard to say her relationship with Oppenheimer helped her out. Obviously, who knows what would happen if she didn't meet her. She met her own sad demise via suicide. There is a theory that she was assassinated and there's a quick shot of her head being uh, pushed under the bathtub with a gloved hand, which is kind of an allusion yeah, to that. Yeah, that was, uh, yeah, I mean, that's not so subtle. No, was, just just a little bit subtle, just a little bit on those. But no, um, I think those two were both terrific, uh, showing their roles of, I guess, kind of being highlights of Oppenheimer's personal life and kind of the tragedy in so many ways that surrounded his personal life. It is. Mm. And unfortunately, it does seem that for a guy that started out as largely, you know, socially inept, he became quite charismatic and... Also, mm. well, I don't know. I guess a cast no. He he, <laughs> he he brought a lot of pain to the women that were in his yeah. life in that way. And those two, very and that's much the unfortunate thing. That. A lot of times yeah. about these tremendous figures, these these great figures. And when we say great, let's be clear about this. We are not talking about this in a moral context. No, we are talking about this in a stature, quantity context. over quality. You know, obviously Einstein was not particularly a great husband no, either. No, but, he was a terrible husband. <laughs> but but when you're the father of general re relativity mm. and considered you know, possibly the greatest scientific mind of all time, mm. those kind of personal details kind of boil away because they just they just don't matter as much in the big picture. No, not at all. And speaking of Einstein, we're, we're going to wrap this up real soon. Yes, I just yes, want to okay. highlight Einstein because at points, yeah. he almost felt like he was a vision to Oppenheimer. So that one scene when just as his um, lawyer disappears, Einstein walks out of nowhere and Oppenheimer's like, thanks, Einstein. It just seems like, are you just envisioning you're seeing this person here? Obviously, that's not the case, but... It was fascinating seeing him, and he was portrayed by a British actor. I can't remember his name, but he was very well portrayed in this as well. It's just odd. I find Einstein to be such such an iconic image. I kind of forget he was a real human being that existed in many ways, Einstein. So just seeing him as a character in a piece like this, I found very interesting. It is. Mm. It really is. And so here, here's the question that I think mm. I want to I ask those you. Mm are tremendous listeners, viewers, subscribers, those that make this whole 80 history thing worthwhile. Yes. After I think, after I see a, a movie that really touches me, something that I think is a, a great piece of cinema, and that one of the things I can definitely say, even though it's going to sound kind of strange given the, the answer I'm going to give you, mm. in an age where... There's so much content mm. that you get something here that's truly cinema. Mm. When you see a truly great one, that kind of ineffable, indescribable feeling the next day after seeing it, did you experience that? Mm. You, Patrick. I think I you did. You watching you know. right now? Mm. I think I did. As much as I enjoyed this film, 
Mm. It didn't happen for me. It didn't happen for you. Fascinating. Maybe I have to go back and see it this, a second yeah. time. Yeah. Maybe it could have been my state of mind. A third time, I think, for you, Paul, wouldn't it be? I thought, well, I, no, I didn't get a chance to see it the second oh, time. Oh, apologies. I, I thought you said you saw it twice. It, okay, apologies. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You're not, not to, not, not to move the veil too much, but uh, <laughs> Paul had a little tumble a week ago. And yeah, just, yeah, yeah. You just get, I'm on the mend now, but. Uh, You're doing good. Sure. Yeah, yeah, I'm hanging in there. Story for another time. I think the leave that no question for our comment. Yeah, yeah. No. One final question. What yeah, would you rate this one movie? Last question. One, one last, last question. question. The what would you rate nobody this? Nobody can. No, nobody can refuse one last question. No. What would you rate this movie out of ten as a movie, and what would you rate it out of ten in regards to historical accuracy? I think as a movie, I'd give it like an eight, maybe, but in regards to historical accuracy, maybe a nine or so. I think this one really hit the nail on the head. Out of everything we've watched for AD History Watches thus far, I feel this has done the best job of um, showing us the history, the real history. So this is a complicated question. <laughs> I'm just asking for a couple of numbers, then we can go home. <laughs> we're both home. Oh yeah, we're both in our homes. <laughs> I, I, I can go have some dinner. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Turn around. <laughs> One in the afternoon. It's five o'clock somewhere, too. Anyway, in an age where there is generic Marvel movie mm. number 597th, where everything has to have a sequel mm. or has to be some bloody revival, mm. this movie shows in a very singular fashion that we are not we don't have to be destined for crap getting no. shoved down our throats that even though a biopic is bio our biopics truly original is it a, an original piece of fiction no of course it isn't but as we have learned when it gets into biopics or Movies about historical epics of actual events. Mm. Just how low the bar can be. Yeah. Beyond just a simple popcorn entertainment. Mm. This movie did a fantastic job. This is an era-defining film. Mm. And oddly enough, Barbie's going to be brought along for the ride. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's kind of fun. <laughs> but it shows the quality and originality and great thinking, great writing, great acting, great execution. The mm. fact that you can keep the audience's attention for three bloody hours yeah. is possible. It's possible. So that in and of itself, I absolutely adore. Mm. So I can't give anything really a 10, you know? <laughs> no, no, I'm not giving it. Yeah, you know, there's only so many Citizen Canes yeah. to go around. Only but so many gladiators. <laughs> there's only so many Dr. Shivagos. <laughs> I have to give it a 9 out of 10 just as a film. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to give it a second pass in terms of my own, you know, kind of ineffable emotional reaction to mm. it afterwards. But I, But for history... Especially when Hollywood really screws the pooch on this a whole lot. Mm. Nine? Yeah, that's where I'm at. I would happily say it's a nine out of ten. It could not put it. the only the only things getting a ten out of ten is a documentary, that being a well made documentary, I suppose. Like when you're doing a fictional retelling, it you, you, there are gonna be aspects you're gonna have to change. But I think a nine's pretty darn good in regards to a blockbuster like this of not having to sacrifice that much in regards to historical accuracy. Indeed. And there is actually mm. one question here that is mm. full throttle GK. Full throttle think... leg? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. What do you think of the film's dismissal of McCarthy? Strauss calls him a clown, but the communist infiltration of the government during that time period is undeniable. Yes, it is mm. undeniable. This has happened. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this definitely happened. High-ranking members of the U.S. government most certainly were working for a foreign power. 
Wow. So we, yeah, it's we, interesting how it kind of ignores that aspect of it, I guess, to a degree. Hence why it's only a 9 out of 10 for historical accuracy. With McCarthy, he ran with this and to to an, obviously an extent, insane extent. You know, he, he, he held on to it and kept holding on to it. Mm. He had this list of names that he just wouldn't tell the public. And then, of course, in, in his true, you know, his truest moment of shame, shame, is when he accused George Marshall, mm. one of the greatest Americans who ever lived, a candidate for one of the greatest Americans of the 20th century. Mm. After that, as far as I was concerned, he earned his fate. So was he a clown? No, you can't call him a clown because a clown couldn't have done what he did. Mm. But he was definitely he was definitely unhinged. He played his hand far too hard. But the reality is, yeah, mm. there was infiltration. Mm. Not to the extent in which he'd like to believe it, or like the American public to believe it. He ran with it, but unlike a far more successful uh, warrior against red infiltration in the person of Richard Nixon, mm. though obviously much later he has his own his own shame and criminality. Mm. McCarthy, you, you can't call him a clown because a clown couldn't do that. But boy. Boy, you don't you don't lose you don't lose any sleep over his fate. You don't shed a tear. But the reality is, as was pointed out by Full Throttle GK, yes, it did start from a point of truth, mm. but it did not proceed from truth. It came from from what we know now is very much political cynicism and opportunism. And I think that's all we have for today. That is all we have for today. Thank you so much for everyone who joined us today. Paul, it's been great fun. Let's do it again. Yeah, let's do it again at some point. For all of you that came and joined us today, thank you for your time. Thank you we so, know, we so know much. We know the timing during the day is, is a little a little awkward, but we we uh Yeah. We really appreciate coming out. There's Those two sides like of the Atlantic the chats, yeah. all that. Absolutely. I mean, when you think about it. From 9 a.m. on, or rather 9.15, on the <laughs> west coast of the United States to starting at 6 p.m. in Central Europe. Mm. That's that's quite a thing. Yeah. We are truly living in the 21st century. It's, it's amazing we can even do this. <laughs> and all I can say is, us here, you there, and thank you for joining this thank episode you. live of AD History Watch It. Have a good day, and until next time.